Hey, what's up? My name is Rob Payone, and welcome to the Proof of Talent podcast, the show where we talk about everything related to the career journey within the crypto, blockchain, and Web3 space. Today, we have a great guest. It is Stephanie from Optimism, who is the head of people there. And in this conversation, it's actually led by my two colleagues, Remy and Connor. They go over a variety of subjects as far as people and talent within the crypto space, as well as what Optimism is doing from a people function and just from building within the industry. Before we hop into that conversation, if you are looking for your next opportunity within the crypto industry, please feel free to reach out to the links below in the YouTube and podcast descriptions. Alternatively, if you are hiring right now for your company, happy to have a chat with you as well. The space right now in the crypto industry, Q2 has been pretty crazy for us. So we've had a ton of really fun and, and solid activity for our hiring partners thus far this year and, and really looking to accelerate and continue that trend. So if you're looking for your next opportunity from a job standpoint, or if you're looking to hire and source talent, please feel free to reach out either way, links below. Now let's hop into that conversation with Stephanie from Optimism. Steph, welcome to the Proof of Talent podcast. It's an honor to have you on. How's everything going? Good. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to dive in today and talk with both of you about crypto talent <laughs> and, <laughs> op and optimism. 100% <laughs> excited to dive into to OP and, and just your journey into the space. And obviously you have such a unique background, but I'd love for you to just dive in like why Web3 and, and what led you to getting into the Web3 space? Yeah, I think um, I kind of started off as more of a crypto skeptic. Um, I wasn't really educated on any of the core components of crypto outside of just knowing about like cryptocurrency and trading, which didn't really interest me. Um, but once I learned actually about the elements of like decentralization and pushing ownership back to users and builders um, and retro um, active public goods funding, which is obviously a, a big part of optimism, um, then it just really clicked for me. Um, so, and I, I joined Optimism um, because a, a former colleague of mine worked here and um, I, I just reached out to him because I was curious about crypto. And then two weeks later, I was, I was working here. Um, so, so yeah, but once, once I learned about Ethereum, it was a really obvious, um, obvious mm. values fit for me. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um very diverse background as well. I feel like you have like the trifecta of just like having the external recruiting agency background, the VC background, and then now in-house, which is super unique. You don't see that often. Um, you see a lot of people go from external to internal, but also having that VC experience is, is awesome. I guess, what were some of the biggest learnings from your experience working at the VC and working with other portcos? Yeah, that's such a good question. So I think that, um, well, first my recruiting experience started off with basically a, a company that just failed spectacularly. So that was a huge learning experience in thinking about um, what to look for in a founder and what I cared about in terms of where I worked. Um, and then Facebook was interesting too, because it just gave me a really good baseline for best practices for like how should a recruiting and like a really strong performance culture um, be run. And then um, definitely the VC is probably the most impactful in just terms of like how I evaluate opportunities because um, I think that everyone joining a startup should um, think like an investor because mm. ultimately when you are working, you're investing your most valuable asset, which is your time. Um, and so I worked for a, um, a very lean venture firm. It's now called Notable Capital. And thankfully, because it was so lean, they actually allowed um, the talent and sort of the platform team to sit in on investor calls on a weekly basis. And so I actually was able to get more of an inside view into how they approach thinking about investments. Um, and what evaluation criteria they're thinking about when they when they think about stuff. And so um, they, they did a lot of early stage investments. And so when you're looking at early stage, there's sometimes there's not a lot of business metrics to look at, like, you know, your pre-revenue, um, 
you know, maybe, maybe they don't even have their first customer yet. Um, and that was kind of the stage that optimism mm. was at when I joined. Um, and so I thought about it and I was like, okay, well, how would, how would these investors look at it? So there's, there's two things. The first is, um, macro environment and like, do you think, what's your thesis like on the overall market in general? And like, do you have a thesis for why this investment vertical makes sense? Um, and I think it became pretty obvious once I learned about Ethereum that, decentralization was like necessary for the future of the internet. And then also that there needed to be a scalable product to, to help with that. And optimism obviously was a leader in the industry and one of the early, um, you know, the early scaling solutions. So, so that made sense. And then the second thing is the founding team. I mean, that's something that these investors would talk about constantly is, is what is the founder like? And, um, and, and you often just have that to go on at a really early stage. And so, um, I think there's, there's two sort of things that were super important. Um, like the single most important thing at a startup can do is to attract and retain the best people. And so is mm. the founder able to convince people of their vision? Um, are they inspiring? And, um, I think after speaking with Jing, who, is, uh, you know, one of our three co-founders of Optimism. Um, and it just became very apparent that she is, you know, she's extremely uh, authentic and also just extremely persuasive. Like the recruiting team is, um, you know, fishermen and she's just like this big juicy worm that we get to put out into the market. And she basically is able to really convince people to like come on her journey with her, especially for something that's like, so, you know, there's a high chance of failure at any startup. Like, and so she's really has always been able to convince people to come up, um, come with her on that journey. <clears throat> and then the second thing that's really important aside from the being inspirational and, and, you know, j getting people on board with your vision is just intellectual humility and, um, the self-awareness to just understand your own weaknesses. And there was just a lot of humility that I saw in the team. They're very authentic, very earnest um, and open about why they're, where they were weak and what they were doing to address those weaknesses, which I saw as a huge, as a huge strength. So, um, so yeah, that's what really convinced me to, to get on board. Yeah, it's, that's amazing. Um, you, I mean, you highlighted a ton of, Great points there. Starting off with like thinking like a VC when it comes to a job search. I think we also, from a agency perspective, look at how the VC landscape correlates with just the job market as well too, which is pretty simultaneous. But you have to go through that like personal awareness process to understand truly like what are the types of roles you're going to be looking for. And it really does come down to like, what's the leadership team? Like, what's the runway? Like, what's the mission? Like, you know, all, all super important parts. And, um, you know, optimism is now proven and continues to show to be one of the strongest, you know, L2s within the space, which is amazing. And I, I'm curious to hear from you, like, how do you guys go about differentiating yourselves? Cause right now the, the market seems to be getting more and more saturated. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So I think the most obvious differentiator is our values and commitment to public goods funding. So um, like optimism began actually as a nonprofit, um, like Carl and Jing and Ben, who are our three co-founders were building Plasma, which was basically an early iteration of Ethereum scaling product. And um, their code base kept getting forked. and but then the companies that would fork their code would go out and raise money from, from investors. But then Jing, Ben and Carl could never find, like they, they were never getting funding because of their, their corporate structure. And, um, mm. and so they decided that they wanted to build something. Basically what we're building at Optimism is what Jing and Carl and Ben wanted. Like when they were first building a company, they're like, how can we stay open source, stay true to our values and still have a sustainable way to, get capital essentially. Um, and so that's, um, that's what we're building is we're, we're building a sustainable way to fund open source software through retroactive public goods funding. 
Um, and, and that's, that's huge. So many parts of the internet are just like held together by people that care, but don't necessarily get paid to, um, to maintain like core pieces of infrastructure. Um, and so, and so that's what we aim to solve. Like we want to provide other avenues to capital. Um, and, and yeah, and I, I just think that's really such an amazing vision and, and so much more than just like scaling a blockchain protocol. Um, it's, and, and mm-hmm. I think it even goes beyond that because, um, we like, think about it. We're, we expect Ethereum to eventually be the global settlement layer, the base layer for all, where all transactions are settled. Optimism, AKA the super chain. So all of our other partners that are, that are coming into the fold, building on the OP stack, um, is eventually going to be how all transactions are settled. And the total revenue from that is essentially, I mean, imagine if we just got a fraction of, of that revenue, um, that could be used to fund public goods beyond just open, open source software. It has the potential to fund things like education or environmental initiatives. And, and that's the beauty of, 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 uh, of blockchain too, is it goes back to the builders and the users. It's not this mm-hmm. exploitative, um, you know, profit center, like, like, you know, what, what web two was. Um, and so I think that is what sets us apart is like this retroactive funding model using, um, and using that money. And it's not just a, a way to pat ourselves on the back and say, Oh, look, look at all the good we're doing, which that's an amazing part of it, obviously. But the other part is that it's an enormous growth flywheel. If people know that when they build things in optimism, they're going to get rewarded and we can positively incentivize people to build what's good for the collective and, and they get, get profit individually or gets profit individually. That is, that is what we're building and, and the vision that, that Jing and Carl um, and Ben really, really drive home all the time. And I think that's what differentiates and sets, sets us apart from other, other L2s. That's amazing. Yeah. After doing some research and listening to you talk, it's, it's really exciting to hear what's coming up for the super chain. And um, I guess a couple questions come to mind for me. Could you break down what maybe the OP stack is for uh, an average listener? And, and um, also, who are some of these key partners and projects using the OP stack to build on the super chain? Yeah, I mean, the OP stack is the core protocol that basically um, all other chains are building on. So it's open source and all of our partners. So base, um, you know, Worldcoin, um, mode, Frax, all these companies that are now deciding to build their own chains, um, are coming into the fold to build on that, um, like that core infrastructure stack. And the idea is that once, um, like we cannot scale Ethereum alone. Um, and I think there's a couple of things within, well, within blockchain generally that everyone's identified as a problem. And that's like a disjointed experience for both de- developers and for users. And so what the super chain solves is basically it solves scalability because we're, we're scaling horizontally instead of just trying to mm. build like the single OP mainnet. Um, We're scaling horizontally with all of these partners, which increases like compute capacity, essentially. And then um, all of those eventually will be interoperable. So it will feel like one seamless experience for the the user and um, and for the developers that are building building on top of it. Um, And so interoperability is basically the name of the game. And I think that... um, You know, that's, it's actually one thing where you look at something like Solana and I think what they have going for them is a, you know, a great um, developer experience, right? And Ethereum mm-hmm. kind of looks at it and it's like, oh, there's all these sort of like fragmented um, experiences and where is a developer going to go build? Are they going to go build on, on OP? Are they going to go to another L2? Um, and so the super chain really solves that by creating a seamless experience for, for every developer. I feel like that's like the true ethos of web three, the way that you guys have built out the ecosystem, the horizontal approach, it's more communal, inviting other people to, it's also built alongside you guys with OP, which is really inspiring. I think other, other chains could probably benefit a lot from, from that approach. 
I'm curious if that's something you guys have implemented as well within the team as well and and just like the culture. Yeah, a hundred percent. So we think of other core contribute like core contributors or decentralized developers as you want to call them as part of the super chain team. Um We've just started doing this, but we're starting to develop a network with other super chain um, co companies within the super chain, sharing best practices across hiring, sharing candidates. Um, like, you know, we have so many amazing candidates and like sort of like silver medalist candidates, or maybe we, um, yeah, I, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of times where, um, you know, where we just have outstanding people that don't make sense for us right now, but they might make sense at another company within the super chain. And so um, we're trying to do our best to figure out how to share um, knowledge and, and candidates between the ecosystem. Yeah, like Remy said, I think that the whole model of the super chain and interoperability really hammers into a key point that I've seen in my experience in Web3 and blockchain, and that's how much collaboration is going on in this space. So it's very cool to hear about uh, all of your um, community initiatives there. And I guess one that particularly comes to mind to me and has been pretty prevalent in the news is how, uh, how is Op Optimism working with BASE? Um, so BASE is a core, uh, core developer, meaning that like we work on core initiatives with them. Um, so they, um, you know, they, I think they're a team of about like 30 folks and we've had people that like share, or, like we share work with them. Um, and that's something that's going to, that's going to continue in the future. Like, and it's not just working on things that's like, you know, small feature sets or, or things that aren't important. It's like big, big ecosystem wide initiatives. Like I know there were a few people that on the base team, uh, along with our team that worked on, um, implement or like helping with the uh, EIP 4844 in the last uh, up the Cancun upgrade or was it Dengun upgrade of, uh, of Ethereum. Um, okay. And so, yeah, Dengun. Yeah. So, so that's like an, uh, a way that we work together. Um, like we recently had an offsite um, with our team and uh, Jesse Pollock from the base team actually came to our offsite as well as some of their developers. So we see it as, we see them as part of our team. Like it's not these individual like disparate teams that don't work together. Like we're all working in alignment towards the same goal of scaling Ethereum and we're more powerful together. And I think that that is what, um, like that's what really sets optimism apart too, is just like we see the decentralization and the use of uh, like the, or the development with other teams and distributed development as a huge differentiator and a superpower for how we will build. Like, I remember this old, like African proverb that used to hang at Facebook when I worked there. And it said, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. And I think that is like really, really just boils down exactly how we see distributed development amongst base and other teams that are also going to come into the fold and not just mm. teams either. I mean, eventually I think it'll be even down to an individual would be able to contribute. Um, and it, it does, they don't have to be part of like some, le you know, like legitimized team that has done it, you know, a big uh, deal with us. Like eventually it would, it would really solve for, for the individual as well. Love the proverb heard that a few times and have definitely like yeah. just implemented that throughout my career it's all about who you're surrounded by and and just like being able to be a good collaborator and obviously for an organization too how you treat your employees is how they're going to treat the clients right the, the customer facing individuals from what you're saying it sounds like just like the company culture you guys have built is really strong it's really potent it's vibrant i'd love to hear more about the culture at op labs yeah. Well, yeah, we've been extremely intentional about our culture. And I think that one of the things that has helped us, one of the key things I really have to give credit where it's due, which is with Jing, Ben, and Carl, who have just sort of held this North Star of open source, um, decentralization, and um, really set us up for the ability to focus on those things long term like um you know we're very um in terms of stability like we they've 
ensured that we have enough runway and all of the, the necessary resources in order to continue to make decisions that basically are aligned with that culture. Um, <clears throat> and I think a lot of companies, what a lot of companies get wrong about culture is that they'll plaster some values under the wall and call it a day. Like Enron famously had integrity as one of its four values. And look at how that ended up. Like, you know, th that's so easy to do. Um, what's not easy to do is how to figure out how to build that culture into how, into your everyday um, behaviors. And so what is, you know, what even is culture? Culture is how people behave at a company. Um, and it's how the company makes decisions. Um, <clears throat> and the most important decisions that a company makes is who do we hire? Who do we promote? And, um, and basically that informs everything else. Um, and the, the idea is that we should be hiring and promoting people that are behaving in accordance with our core values. Um, and so when you think about that, it's just about thinking about the employee life cycle. So, um, you know, attract the, there's, there's kind of four out or five elements to the, to any employee life cycle. Um, so it's attracting, hiring, growing, retaining, and then offboarding. And so it's thinking about how to take that core culture and building that into your people mechanisms. So, um, and your processes mm. and, um, making sure that at every turn you're reinforcing those cultural components, um, so that people are reminded how to behave and, and clear expectations of how they, they should behave. Um, and so, you know, thinking about attracting and hiring, it's like, um, we, we set a really clear, uh, precedent at the beginning, like, Hey, here's our culture. We hope this is a filtering mechanism. If you say, I don't like this culture, that's actually fine with us. And we prefer that. Um, and, and then like in the hiring process, really making sure that we're being really intentional about how we evaluate values alignment and what people care about. Um, and actually I think our ability to do that really, really helped us during the bear market because when things get tough and, you know, when token prices are volatile and all this stuff, like I didn't ever hear, I didn't hear someone talk about that a single time in the past few years. Like, and that's, I think about Jing and Ben and Carl have really done an incredible job of building a missionary and not a mercenary culture. And I think that's super important in crypto. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, that, that's another part. And then I think too, about growing and retaining and offboarding, it's all about, um, how do we incorporate our values into performance management, how in manager behaviors, um, in, in offboarding, like one of our key values is continuous improvement and, uh, basically seeking feedback always. Um, and one of the things that we've done, even in our offboarding is like, we do exit interviews and we focus, you know, with every single employee, whether they choose to leave or whether we choose to, um, let them go. Like either way, we want to get feedback. Um, and, and yeah, like our values are part of our performance management process and managers evaluating how has this person like adhered to these values and shown these values in their everyday work. Um, and really, highlighting that stuff and making sure that the people that do live those values are like rewarded and recognized continually. Um, and having the, the founders call that out too is really powerful. That's amazing. Well, it sounds like you, you all have done some incredible work on the culture side there. And I guess for you specifically, I mean, you've been there for a little over two and a half years. What has been like something you're most proud of in incorporating into the culture? Oh, um, yeah, I think that the the thing that I'm most proud of is, yeah, pro I mean, honestly, probably what I just um, what I just mentioned is like making sure that the hiring process is really um, is really tight and focused around values and um, and creating that missionary versus versus mercenary culture. Um, uh, another thing is is the the culture of high performance, um, and I think that that is a really hard thing. Like, it's it's one thing to get really talented people in the door, and it's another thing to make sure ensure that they continually stay engaged and at optimal performance. 
And so some of the things that we've um, implemented from the people side that I'm really proud of are um, just how we think about, um, you know, how we are, um, yeah, just how we're thinking about scaling and, and how we think about high performance culture from a management perspective. So basically like um, when we think about performance and hiring, one of the things is that, and this has actually helped us stay, um, like stay really stable and avoid layoffs and avoid kind of like bloat as we grow is, um, when we bring in the, uh, when we bring in people, the first thing that we're asking is always like, okay, do we need this? Why do we need this role? And, um, I learned this from companies that grew way too fast. Like the natural inclination if things aren't going well at a company is to throw bodies at the problem. But increasing management overhead just mm. complicates things more. And managing is super hard work. Um, and so, like I said, like hiring is the most important and most expensive thing the company does. So it's really important to get it right. Um, and it's also really important to drive home with the manager that hiring and managing is a huge responsibility and a privilege. And the privilege is granted when managers have done the necessary pre-work to justify the hire and think about performance. And I think this is how we reinforce the performance culture. Um, so like instead, as I mentioned, like we, um, well, we always have the, instead of a job description, we actually have managers build out what is called a job target. So it forces them to identify mm. the key metrics of success. Like instead of just saying like, okay, here's the qualifications, here's the responsibilities. Um, and it, like the, the job target is more around actual deliverables that you're expecting from this person. And that forms the basis for like a 30, 60, 90 that they would be building with their direct report. Um, and, and so it's like, what's the, the top three things this person is going to be delivering the first six months on the job? Um, and that really focus, makes the hiring manager think about, okay, why am I hiring this person? And, and what, are, what are they delivering to the, to the collective? Um, the other thing that we've recently implemented is called good performance, bad performance. So we stole this directly from Ben Horowitz's book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. And it's so simple, but it's so effective. So it requires that every manager writes out the behaviors of a good hire and a bad hire. So for instance, I'm hiring a technical recruiter right now. I have a document. It's about two pages long and it's called good recruiter, bad recruiter. And it clearly articulates how a recruiter behaves, how a good recruiter behaves, and how a bad re recruiter behaves. So how does a good recruiter treat a candidate experience? And how does a bad recruiter treat a candidate experience and hiring manager, manager experience? And so this document, it's not only used in hiring, but it's also used in onboarding and performance management. And so it's very easy to evaluate performance if that performance is clearly articulated. Um, and that's what we're trying to do from the very beginning of the employee life cycle. And so I think that has been um, kind of a bigger unlock for us in, in managing performance and making sure that we continue to have um, a really high performing culture. I feel like I'm at a, a workshop right now for <laughs> early stage founders that are trying to scale. <laughs> a, lot of, uh, a lot of good no knowledge and, and wisdom here. And... I think like there's a lot of VC capital being deployed into the market right now. Uh, a lot of people are scaling, whether that's for some of their first engineering hires, a lot of marketing and BD as well too. But I think it's important to really do the pre-work, right? And understand, like you said, what is the type of person that I want to join the team? Why do I want them to join? If you're not doing that, that could really, you know, you could really bite the bullet with that later on and hiring like you said, is one of the most expensive aspects of, of growing and scaling a company. I'm curious for you guys, as team, like what are some of the most important qualities and skills that you look for when going to hire new talent? Yeah. One of the things that we've noticed that really makes a successful person at optimism is someone who's super high agency. Um, and really takes ownership of like everything that they get their hands on. And, um, and 
yeah, is finding the problems and, and also owning the solutions. And so that's something that we look for. I think that's like really important. It's important for any early stage company. Um, the other thing I think that's super important is like intellectual curiosity. Like you have to kind of be really, um, like, yeah, just, um, really curious about what's going on in our industry because it is changing so rapidly. Like when I first joined, like the whole industry was, um, you know, it was all about OP mainnet and then we launched super chain and it was like, what even is this? You know, like everyone was kind of like, what is this super chain thing? And now everyone is kind of pivoted to that model, um, where it's about horizontal scaling. And so you kind of have to, we hire these people that are like very much questioning like the, what they know, um, because they know that if you don't question and you kind of just stick with the status quo, like you're going to get left behind. Um, and then the other thing I think is, is just people, um, well, there's two other things that relate back to our values. Um, so the first one is just being, um, feedback seeking. So people that are like really humble people that can clearly articulate like how they've grown and how they've made attempts to do that and um can clearly articulate how they've been like wrong in the past or like just a willing to be willingness to be very self-reflective um and we find that people with that type of growth mindset are also really successful here um and then i think the other one is just like people that are really optimistic which is like as corny as it sounds um it's that has been why we've been so successful is our ability to be super experimental and kind of take on these audacious goals that, um, that frankly, like are, are kind of crazy. Like we're reinventing the internet. We're building decentralized compute. Like that's not something that like a lot of people think is, a um, you know, that, that's not a small goal. It's a very, very large goal. And so, we've kind of always been really experimental. Um, like on my first day at work, um, two and a half years ago, the whole company scrapped the entire code base and rebuilt it from scratch. It did like a full regenesis. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, let's go. <laughs> like, what what, what company have I joined? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And really that was actually such a pivotal moment for us because that was when we went from using um, the OVM to being um, on like Ethereum equivalent. Uh, so instead of being Ethereum compatible, we went through to Ethereum equivalent, which is then something that we saw like the whole um, kind of the whole industry move to. And I mean, decentralized sequencing like has has skeptics. And now I think that's like seen as a, a very like, you know, a necessary uh, thing that we need to accomplish, but was kind of seen as you know, a little bit cuckoo when it first, like when it was first uh, thought of. And so there's been, same with the super chain, like all of these ideas have been like highly experimental and a little bit, um, yeah, just very audacious and a little bit nuts. Um, and I think that that's the kind of attitude you have to have when you're building something as, as big and audacious and, and as hairy as a, of a problem as, as optimism is solving. That's amazing. Yeah, it sounds like y'all are targeting the right people. So uh, good luck with your searches here. And I guess that kind of brings me to my point or my next question here moving forward. What is like the horizon look like in terms of hiring growth at Optimism, maybe at like a three, six year timeline? Yeah, definitely. So as I said before, like we're, I think we're always focusing on how can we outsource to other parts of the, like other parts of the community. So even recently, like we were looking at a potential aqua hire and it's like, oh, we're not going to aqua hire a company. We're going to actually give them a grant to work on some really meaty parts of the protocol. And I think that's always our, um, that is always the way that we, we think about building the ecosystem broadly. But in terms of hiring um, at OP Labs and at the Optimism Foundation, um, I think we're, I mean, right now through the end of the year, we're, we're going to add about 75 heads um, to, and our com the company right now is about uh, just a little over a hundred. Um, most of those hires are going to be in um, engineering and security. Um, we're always looking for protocol engineers and obviously making a huge investment in security is so important um, as we have already, but continuing to grow that, that team. Um, product is also another area that we're going to be hiring a lot of. 
Um, and so, so yeah, those are kind of the, the key focal areas for us over the next, uh, the next year. And then I think, um, yeah, beyond that, I imagine that the, the industry will probably change yet again. And, and maybe we'll focus on, we, we don't even know what we're probably going to be hiring for in, you know, I think, I think you said like three years. I don't, I don't know that we have a, a plan fully built out for that just yet, but it'll probably be dependent on where the super chain goes and, um, and how many external teams were able to onboard to, to contribute to that mm. mission. Nice. 75. Wow. That's a lot. Um, very exciting <laughs> yeah. times ahead for, for OP. And I was going to say, you mentioned aqua hiring. I don't know if I'm not that familiar with that concept. Some other people in the audience might not be as well. Can you explain in more depth what that means and what that looks like? Yeah, absolutely. So that's where and a company or, you know, a, a larger company is maybe going to look at an acquisition target to potentially acquire that company for the purposes of acquiring the talent specifically. So maybe there's like a small project that has 10 engineers that are like really niche, um, super important engineers to the industry. We might consider like purchasing or a company may consider purchasing that co that particular company just to hire that talent. Um, and that's not something um, that optimism has ever done, but it, it is a very common strategy in just tech broadly. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we look at, when we've looked at companies and what they're contributing, instead of thinking like, oh, how can we make like OP labs a bigger company or the foundation bigger or like, you know, bring, bring more headcount. We are often thinking about how to integrate them into the work that's on our current engineering roadmap. Um, and instead of like, you know, bringing them into our legal entity, um, we're actually just thinking about bringing them into the collective broadly and having them contribute to those development efforts um, through, a, through a grant. So, um, so that's how we approach it. And I know a question that we had uh, discussed on our, our warm-up conversation here was something around um, scaling sustainability and, and intentionally. Do you have any um, points to uh, how optimism is approaching that? That is like, I mean, the first question we always ask ourselves when we, uh, well, our natural inclination is to operate as a lean startup. Uh, because ultimately our goal is not to grow this centralized corporation that does all of the work for the protocol. Um, it's to eventually give our power away to the community and to decentralize. So every time a hiring manager asks for headcount, um, we also think about, is there a world where an external contributor can do this work? And how do we get more people involved in optimism that isn't just OP Labs or the Optimism Foundation? Um, and like I said before, like we consider core developers like part of their optimists. They're they're we see them as as part of the collective. Um, for instance, like an, a great example of this is um, we actually have a couple of external teams working on zk proofs right now, um, where they actually like worked like submitted an RFP um, to and and have received a grant to work on that that specific work. Um, and so, so yeah, so that is, that's one way that we've kind of grown sustainably where it's not just like adding headcount, um, that, you know, when we, event, when, um, you know, if, and when we change a strategy, then maybe that headcount doesn't make sense anymore. And so that's how we've been able to, to think, um, I think a little bit differently than just like scaling for scaling sake. Um, and I think just being really intentional about like, for using that forcing function that I mentioned earlier about um, like really articulating performance, articulating the need for the role. Um, and the other thing is not like low performing managers should not um, have be able to hire until like the performance problems on their teams are, are fixed. Um, because I think that, that just like adds to the problem as well. Um, so, so really just thinking about um, yeah, how to grow like, more slowly um and or or just like more intentionally like we've still grown rather you know rather quickly and we've scaled um but i think also the other thing is how are we incentivizing recruiters as well like 
if we're just saying, hey, you know, you have to fill 10 engineering roles by the end of this quarter, that is misincentivizing our recruiting team. Um, mm-hmm. We need to say, you need, I've always said with my team, like you, you should be focused on filling it with the right hire, not a hire. And how do we determine if it's the right hire? Uh, through this really robust structured interviewing pr- process that we've built out. But also it sort of gives the recruiters the permission to raise the flag if they do have a concern. Because we're not going to say, oh, you're, you're in trouble, but you didn't hit your, your numbers. It's more like, no, we're, we're actually holding you accountable to make sure that this is a really diligent process and that you're getting um, the right person in the role. And that's why I think we have, you know, very, very low retention numbers and, um, or sorry, very low attrition um, and turnover and high yeah. retention. Um, and um, yeah, that's why we have, um, you know, high, low turnover and, and high retention. And also um, why I think, uh, why we've just been able to attract people that are really, really here for the long-term vision, um, you know, and not just here for the, the next market cycle, basically. Definitely. I, I first just want to say thank you. Like it's it's been such an informative podcast. I think OP and the Optimism ecosystem are extremely lucky to have you. Um, a lot of just like ex- great experience to to continue growing on the Ethereum ecosystem and and OP. So uh, I guess kind of as we wrap up this this conversation, like any like final pieces of wisdom or advice for maybe some newcomers that are looking to break into Web three. Yeah. I think just, oh man, stay curious. Like, I think the way that I onboarded to Web3 was just being like a, yeah, just consuming so much um, information about the industry and blogs, podcasts like this. Um, And I think anyone looking to break in, I don't think, I think as long as you demonstrate like a lot of interest and curiosity and get involved, there's so many ways to get involved in Web3, either joining a DAO or going to a conference and, and you know, participating in a hackathon. Like there's a zillion ways to, um, to kind of get involved that aren't just being gatekept by like, oh, you need to, you know, how to get your job. There's a way to participate that isn't, um, you know, that's not just working full time. And I think if, if full time, uh, working full time at a crypto company is your eventual goal, um, I think that that that's a really great entry point for people to start um or all of those those things are a really great great way to start um and if you're looking to to join full time go to jobs uh, dot optimism dot i o and that's a full list of every single job that's available at o p labs um optimism foundation optimism unlimited as well as all of the partners in the super chain that are hiring so um you know jobs are definitely becoming more uh you know, more available as the market picks up. And there's definitely a lot more VC activity, I think, than there once was. And so that's definitely going to correlate to, to more opportunity um, in the future. That's amazing. And uh, thank you for shouting out the, the job boards for the Optimism yeah. ecosystem. <laughs> and I, I, I guess uh, one last question on that, too. If someone is interested in learning more about Optimism and the ecosystem in general, where can they go to find some resources? Yeah, go to optimism.io and um, that will basically be your like your entry point to everything from our, you know, developer docs to more information about the super chain um, to our discord um, and getting involved in the community. Um, That is, yeah, that's the best place to go to, to learn more. Steph, thank you so much for your time. It's It's been an honor yeah. having you on the Proof of Talent podcast. Excited to continue following your journey and, and the impact you're making at OP. So yeah, thank you for everything. Awesome. Thanks so much Thanks, for Steph. having me.